Welcome to Haunted Talks, the official podcast of The Haunted Walk, offering thematic walking tours in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, Ontario. My name is Jim Dean. I am the creative director of the company, and thank you so much for joining us for this episode. Spring has finally sprung, and we're back to doing tours virtually every evening in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto. So if you're going to be visiting any of those cities, please look us up. Or if you're making your travel plans for the summer and we'll be in town, we'd love to have the opportunity to share a little darker history with you. So please visit our website, hauntedwalk.com. You can find all the tour details there, as well as other fun stuff that we're up to. If you are enjoying the podcast, we'd certainly would love to get a five-star review from you, particularly on iTunes. I always love hearing from our listeners. So if you have any guest or topic ideas, any suggestions, or just want to say hello, please feel free to email me. My address is jim at hauntedwalk.com. I'm very excited to introduce today's guest. Professor David J. Hand is a senior research investigator and emeritus professor of mathematics at Imperial College London and chief scientific advisor to Winton Capital Management. He has served twice as the president of the Royal Statistical Society and is on the board of the UK Statistics Authority. He has published 300 scientific papers and 26 books. He has broad research interests in the areas including classification, data mining, anomaly detection, and the foundation of statistics. He was made an Officer of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, or OBO, for services to research and innovation in 2013. So a very, very distinguished guest. And today we will be discussing his book, The Improbability Principle, Why Coincidences, Miracles, and Rare Events Happen Every Day. Professor David J. Hand, thank you so much for joining us. That's a great pleasure. I don't believe I have ever had the opportunity to speak with a statistician before, so it makes me very curious to hear a little about your backstory. How did you come to end up pursuing mathematics as your life's work? Okay, that's an interesting question. I think I I became interested in mathematics when I was um, very young, and I suppose I was around when computers were starting to become important, and so I suppose I got swept up in the... um, the power, the opportunity, the potential uh, that these things had, um, and it just went on from there. I should say, however, a little bit of a sort of nerdish sort of comment, really I don't regard, and many statisticians don't regard statistics as as a branch of mathematics. Certainly it's a mathematical discipline, but it's more than just mathematics, because it's so closely involved with data and the real world. So the statisticians typically, there are a few exceptions, of course, uh, typically regard um, statistics as slightly different from mathematics. For the average person, why is it a wise idea to have at least a basic understanding about mathematical principles such as probability? It's very important for, for citizens to understand statistics in general because so much of the world now hinges on numbers. For probability in particular, uh, The world is an uncertain place. It involves risk, chance, good luck, bad luck, this sort of thing. And to understand, to cope with that, um, I think it is very important to have a grasp of of those sorts of things. Could you share with us an example of when knowledge of probability has or should have made a tremendous difference in regards to decision making? I suppose I have many examples. Um, I I suppose an obvious one, which we'll probably talk about later, is the lottery. If um, you're down to your last uh, dollar or, or pound or whatever, then you shouldn't spend it on the lottery because that's, that's, um, you're, you're not going to win. And we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about that in detail, I'm sure, later on. Um, but, but I think in general, people underestimate the role that chance plays in their lives. So whether they get a good job, whether they get a bad job, it depends so much on who they happen to meet, where they happen to train, what qualifications they happen to have. Accidental sort of things that occur, events that occur about their life, and people people like to sort of think this is. They like to establish causality. They like to think if I do this, then this will happen. But chance um, is a very big player in these sorts of things. People basically, I think, underestimate the role of, of chance in life. I'm curious how being a statistician affects your day to day life. 
Uh, for example, are you running probabilities all, you know, all the time throughout the day? You know, what time you have to leave work to beat traffic, when to buy plane tickets, insurance, when to buy it, when, when to pass. For a statistician, does probability almost become like a way of life? No, I, I think um, as far as those sorts of questions are concerned, I'm just the same as, as everybody else. And I probably make fairly irrational personal decisions like that. <laughs> Maybe if I did sit down and, you know, so, so the lottery, for instance, again, um, I sometimes buy lottery tickets. But again, the chance of winning is so small and a rational, a rational decision would be not to do it. I think I'm just as irrational as everybody else. A lot of folks find mathematics, statistics, very intimidating or very hard. Is there any advice you could give to them that might change their perspective? Okay, I think there is just one single message. Yes, it's often not easy, but you can understand it. You just have to work at it. I think that's that's really all there is to it. And this applies, you know, it's not just people who sort of hated maths at school kind of thing. It applies even to professional mathematicians, if they go into another area of mathematics, they don't understand it. It's really hard. They have to spend time working at it uh, until they can grasp it. Um, So I think it's not so much that people aren't good at it. It's that people haven't sort of recognized that it just requires a bit of effort. You know, you pick up the violin the first time, obviously you're not going to be able to play that exceptionally well. I mean, let me, let me, I'm glad you mentioned violin because there's this classic thing, isn't there, the 10,000 hours. To be an expert at anything, you need to put in 10,000 hours, a colossal number of hours of practice. Um, I'm not suggesting that people need to put in that sort of number of hours to become reasonably, uh, develop reasonable facility with mathematics. But it's a similar sort of thing. You just need to put in the, the effort to, to develop the expertise. Turning to your book, The Improbability Principle, why coincidences, miracles, and rare events happen every day. I I have to imagine there may have been some folks, particularly those maybe of religious persuasion or those who see meanings in symbols, who might argue that your book is trying to take some of the the magic, I guess, out of life. How do you respond to to that criticism? That that is... um... Yeah, that is a question I'm often asked uh, after I've given a talk uh, on the improbability principle. I'm often asked, so do you go through life experiencing these amazing events and thinking, well, you were know, just tedious, no, nothing exciting about that at all? And my answer is no, not at all. Just because you understand something doesn't mean it takes the magic away. And I usually give this exa- the example and analogy of the, the rainbow. So when you don't understand how a rainbow works, you walk out and you see a rainbow arcing across the sky and you think, wow, isn't that incredible? All those colors, you know, magical, as you say. Um, But when you do understand it, you understand the physics behind it and how light reflects and refracts around inside the raindrops. When you go outside and you look at a a rainbow, you still think, my goodness, isn't that incredible? How wonderful. And in fact, you probably think it even more because of all you understand all the subtleties and the complexities of the physics are going on. So the short answer is just because you understand why these highly improbable events should be expected to happen, um, that doesn't in any way detract from the sense of wonder. One of my favorite uh, chapters in your book it's called the law of truly large numbers. And uh, there are several laws in the book. We won't get into them all. Uh, scientific, observational, which either affect probability or seem to affect our perception of probability. I wonder if you could uh, talk to us a little bit about how truly large numbers play into probability. Yeah, this is one of the, the fundamental sort of laws of the improbability. I, I, Perhaps I should say at the start that the improbability principle isn't a single law. There are five laws which sort of braid together, entwine together to form a sort of rope, which is the improbability principle. And as you say, one of them, one of these five laws is the law of truly large numbers. This is a bit different from the law of large numbers, which statisticians talk about. The law of truly large numbers basically says if you've got something which has got a very small probability of occurring, but you give it a truly large number of opportunities to occur, then it becomes almost certain that it will happen. I can give you a a little example, if you like. The the, the chance of of any particular individual being struck by lightning, being killed by a lightning strike, for instance, is very, very small. Tiny chance of being uh, killed by a lightning strike. 
but there are 7 billion people in the world. In fact, around the world, the chance of being killed by a lightning strike in any one year is about 1 in 300,000, so a tiny probability. But there are 7 billion people in the world. Um, 7 billion people is a truly large number. So you take that very small probability, each of them has got a 1 in 300,000 chance of being killed by a lightning strike, and you multiply it by that truly large number, 7 billion, and it turns out you would expect around 20, 25,000 people every year to be killed by lightning strikes, and that's what happens. Uh, they are. So the law of truly large numbers says if you've got a tiny chance of something happening, but you give it enough opportunities to happen, it becomes almost certain that it will happen. That's that's really fascinating. And does that mean then, I think you just mentioned one in, one in 300,000 or so, but even within, I guess, that probability, the probability of that per individual uh, can vary greatly depending on their own personal circumstances, you know, like where they, where they spend their time, I assume. If they're, you know, on top of buildings holding metal often, that would seemingly increase the, the probability. You are spot on. And um, one of the other laws of the improbability principle, the law of the probability lever, uh, focuses on that, that different circumstances can change probabilities substantially. So exactly as you say, if you're in an office, it's going to be far less than one in 300,000 chance of being killed by a lightning strike. But if you're standing on top of the building holding a metal sword or something, it's going to be much higher. And those difference in circumstances can make a huge difference in probability. That's the law of the probability lever. And for someone particularly intimidated by math, they might think that calculating probabilities is a very mechanical or uh, mathematical process. And obviously that is, that is a significant part of it. But in the book, I was really fascinated by how much uh, human judgment or human subjectivity can play in the role in establishing probability. Could you a little, explain a little bit to us about how the, the, the human side or judgment does play a role also in how we, we calculate odds or probability? Yes, we can. One of the sort of basic ways of calculating probability is to look at a, um, look at a whole, I suppose we want to know the chance that a, a, an object in a collection is colored red. What we could do, the basic way of calculating it, is to look at all the objects in the collection, see what colours they are and see how many of them are red. Then if we were to draw one at random, that proportion would be our probability. Um, now, to do that, you have to decide on what collection of objects. You, you, you also have to decide which ones are coloured red. So there, there, is, there are sort of decisions about what you're, um, what you're doing here. In fact, a nice example of this was, um, a, a, and a very powerful example, was given by the... Um, uh, biologist Stephen Jay Gould. I don't know if you recall him. He, he was a very eminent biologist and popularizer of science. Um, and he died of cancer uh, a few years ago. But when he was 40, he was diagnosed with this particularly nasty form of cancer. And he was told that the median survival time was eight months. Half the people with this cancer were dead in eight months, and only half would live longer than eight months. Um, what he did, though, was he went, and, you know, after recovering from the shock, he, he went away and, and looked at the numbers. And this is where the human sort of decisions and, and so on comes in. What he did was he looked at the numbers and saw that the eight months referred to everybody who, who was found out, diagnosed with this form of cancer. Um, whereas he was relatively young, apart from the cancer, he was, in, he was in pretty good health. He was an optimistic sort of person. He, his financial means were reasonable. He had a whole load of other factors which wouldn't have applied to everybody who was diagnosed in this way. And when he took that into account, he became much more optimistic because he figured that they were all factors which would mean that he was more likely to survive for, for, for longer than eight months. And as it happened, he survived for another 20 years. And that reminds me of another example I think you had in the book about um, sudden infant death syndrome, where a woman was charged, particularly I think it was after her second son, uh, unfortunately uh, passed away in that way. And the probability of that happening even in and of itself, uh, if, you, if you're taking it per case level, is, is, is quite high. But there were other factors. I think you mentioned, for example, you know, the gender of the child, uh, the fact that the mother had 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 one child who had already, um, ex you know, suffered this fate, uh, which dramatically can change the odds, even while most of us think it's, you know, extremely unlikely. Exactly. Exactly. This was a particularly tragic case. As you say, two of her, 
the children died from this sudden infant death syndrome, and, and, and she was charged with murder and found guilty. And, and some of the evidence on which the guilty verdict um, was arrived at was the simple calculation that what's the chance of having one child with this um, uh, uh, die of this? And if that's the chance of having one child die of it, the chance of having two must just be the product of those two chances. So a very, very small chance. But that calculation is wrong for exactly the reason you said. If you have one child die of it, then you're much more likely to have another one die of it as well. And if you take that into account, in fact, in this particular case, it meant that they, it was more likely that they were accidental deaths, you know, just natural deaths, as it were, than murder. It would have flipped the verdict around completely. And indeed, eventually on appeal, she was released. That's interesting. Statistics playing a, a significant role in a, in a, in a legal matter like that. You did mention lotteries earlier, and I know that's one it's a subject I imagine our listeners will have uh, some interest in. And uh, I guess just on a very basic level, as a statistician, are there any kind of very basic principles in the lottery where we're dealing with those truly large numbers of entries out there? Is there any minor statistic advantage you can use by you know deploying a certain strategy when you're picking your lottery numbers or buying your tickets? There are several strategies, yes. Um, the first strategy, and the most obvious, doesn't change the probabilities, but it changes the amount you will win or are expected to win if you do win. Um, and, and this is to just buy uh, a ticket on a rollover week. Because uh, if the jackal hasn't been won and has rolled over to the next week, then it's twice as large in the next week. So should you be incredibly lucky and win, you will get more money. So on average, if you do that, adopt that sort of policy, you, you will make more money. Um, and there are other strategies as well. There are strategies through which you can um, increase your probability of winning. Um, and this is, uh, one is, um, and unless you spend a lot of money, it's not going to increase the probabilities much. But one strategy is to buy, not spread your tickets out one every week, for instance, but to buy them all in one go to buy different tickets all in one week. So rather than spending uh, one, buying one ticket a week for 10 weeks, buy 10 different numbered tickets in one week. And that will slightly increase your, your, your chance of winning. Um, but uh, unless, uh, people have taken that this to extremes. Um, and I, I, there was um, a classic case of um, the International Lotto Fund in, a, in America who, who spotted that um, a particular lottery had rolled over um, until it was a $27 million jackpot. And the particular, it was a 646 lottery, which meant that there were only 7 million different lottery tickets. So you can see where I'm going here, I'm sure. You could buy all 7 million different numbered lottery tickets, all sets of six different numbers. And that would mean you were guaranteed, your probability was one of holding the jackpot winning ticket. So that would have increases your, increased your chance of winning the jackpot. But of course, it would cost you $7 million. And then I assume if anybody else happened to pick those same numbers, you know, halving your jackpot or, you know, cutting it down by large percentages, you could end up losing several million dollars. Exactly. I mean, it, it, I was careful in my words there. It guaranteed that you would hold the jackpot winning ticket, but it didn't guarantee that you would win $27 million. That's absolutely right. Perhaps uh, Mrs. Smith down the road buys one ticket a week, and this week happened to get lucky as well. So half the jackpot. And indeed, if more than two people won it, you could, as you say, end up losing money. Yeah. But just to, just to be clear, so we don't give uh, anyone false hope, even using those strategies, your odds are still quite remote that you will be the a, a winner, a holder winning ticket. <laughs> yeah. there, there's another law in probability called Burrell's Law. Burrell was a, Emil Burrell was a very eminent uh, mathematician. Um, and he basically said that um, if a probability is small enough, you should regard it as impossible. Um, what he meant was if it's small enough, you should behave as if it's not going to happen because that's the only rational way to behave. And I'm afraid that with probabilities of winning the lottery are in that sort of ballpark. You're, more like, you're much more likely to be struck, killed by a lightning strike, as we've, we've already discussed, um, on, on, or struck by an asteroid. Um, so, you know, rationally, one should behave as if winning the lottery is not going to happen to any particular individual. The lightning strikes, I found was quite interesting. 
in the book, you mentioned the, the kind of the large numbers. And when it is totally true, when I saw that 24,000 people were killed each year by lightning, at first, without thinking about it, that seemed like, wow, I don't know anyone who's ever been hit by lightning. So, but then, you know, you start thinking about the large numbers, but it was also curious because you mentioned one gentleman and I forget the number of times he has been hit by light or hit, well, has been hit by lightning. Um, but it was an extraordinary number over, over 10, I seem to recall at least. How do, how do we explain uh, someone being that unlucky, I guess? Well, this is back to what you mentioned earlier. It's the law of the probability lever. Um, in his particular case, he was a Virginia Park Ranger. So it's a bit like your man standing on the roof with a sword. Uh, you know, he's wandering around expecting, uh, not expecting, but in some sense, he's sort of asking for it. So it's not at all surprising that in his case, he occasionally got struck by lightning. And out of all the people, all the Virginia or whatever Park Rangers who get struck by lightning, there are going to be some who get struck by lightning most often. So is there a kind of very basic checklist you could give for us. You know, the next time I'm randomly opening a drawer at home and someone's photo falls out who's moved across the country, and you know, and then that very afternoon I run into them while I'm getting tea or something, is there, before we start losing our minds and, you know, thinking the world is, uh, you know, uh, remarkable things are happening, what's kind of the basic checklist of, of questions we should ask ourselves when we find ourselves caught in a coincidence, miracle, or an extremely rare event? Yeah. I, I think what one needs to do is to recognise that there are all sorts of other things that have happened during the day or during your you know during the week, which haven't been coincidences, and so you haven't noticed them. They haven't been forced into your consciousness. They've just gone on, and they're just sort of normal events. Just by chance, occasionally, this sort of thing happens, and when it happens, wow! You think you, your attention is drawn to it. You notice it, and so really. What, we, what this is is an illustration of, you know, that life is full of buzzing events, all sorts of things happening one after the other. Um, but when something like that comes to our attention, it forces itself in our minds and we know it's not magical uh, in the sense of mysticism or, or anything like that. It's to be expected that some of these things should happen just by chance occasionally. And I think you've made an interesting point in the book uh, where two, I think they were amateur golfers, hit uh Got got holes in one on back to back back to back groups or whatever you know right back to back, which seems astronomical. But really, that I think we're talking about here. That's it, it, would this be kind of like a selection bias where we're going to ignore everyone else playing golf who's you know doesn't have this experience of the millions of rounds probably played each day, and then we're just you know our mind is because this happened this one time it's reported to us uh, in the news that kind of changes how we think about it. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, there is a website which actually reports, reports these things because they're so striking. But I think this is another example of the law of truly large numbers. If you think of the number of golf, golf courses, the number of people who play golf every year, it would be amazing if people didn't occasionally get holes in one, just just by chance, even if they're no good at golf. If you share a number of stories in the book, but what is your kind of favorite coincidental story that, that's, that seems mind-blowing, but, but maybe is not? Possibly the one I opened the book with, which uh, features Anthony Hopkins in a film called The Girl from Petrovka. This was some time ago. He, he was going to star in this film. And he went down to London to buy a copy of the book so he could, he could read up about the character. Um, but he couldn't find one. Uh, so he gave up. And on his way home, he was sitting, waiting for a, a, a tube train to arrive. And he noticed a book on the seat next to him. And he picked it up. And it was, in fact, a copy of The Girl from Petrovka. Of, of the book. Um, but there's more to this story. Um, later, he, he told the author, uh, George Pfeiffer, uh, about this. And um, it turned out that the book was the same copy that um, George had been annotating to convert from American English or English, you know, from one to the other to convert the spellings. And he lent it to a friend who had, who had lost it. Um, and that was the copy that Anthony Hopkins found. And by sort of some extraordinary fluke, it had found its way through space and time back to, back to the author. In fact, I, um, I contacted George Pfeiffer after this. In fact, he contacted me. I, I was giving a talk on the, on the radio, um, and he contacted me afterwards to say, yes, that's exactly how it had happened. And, and so what, what, I mean, what, what's the behind the scenes there? Like what, what things would we have to keep in mind um, in, in the Anthony Hopkins story? 
again, these, I think in this case, two particular things, really, that are all truly large numbers, lots of things like this going on, and then um, lots of things going on. And second, this one being forced on our attention. We're remembering it, noticing it, and, and telling people about it. You know, it's, in, it's on the web, it's in the news, these sorts of things. So, so, you know, so, you, so you notice these things. Whereas all the other things which are going on, no reason why you should notice them, no reason why they should be draw, or drawn to your attention. So this is a one in a million chance, but there are another 999,999 things going on, which we just don't pay any attention to. Before letting you, you go, I do have a, a, a more general question. We've been paying particular close attention to the uh, uh, politics in the United States these days, in, in particular the Democratic nomination process, and there have been a, a lot of accusations with some seemingly strong evidence that there is some type of voter suppression or electoral fraud happening. I've seen a number of exit polls that have not matched up in, in any way to the, in the end, certified results, uh, exit polls being one of the the standards we use to kind of monitor elections around the world. If we were to wanting to investigate the, this idea of, 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 of election fraud or voter suppression in this process, as a statistician, what kind of evidence would you start looking at? Or what would be some, some of your methodology, methodology to, to figure out that question? Yeah, this, I, I looked at this sort of thing, not in this particular election. I didn't know about that in this particular election, those suspicions. Um, well, one of the things you would look at is, is sort of distributions of um, voters and so on. Um, and I can remember other elections in other countries where uh, it turned out that the proportion of people voting it w was absurdly high compared with the people who normally vote, those sorts of things. And you'd also look at how they're distributed across the different candidates. Um, you'd also look for... Uh, Strange, strangely rounded numbers. When people make up numbers or something like that, they often can't make them up in, in, a, in a way which is actually very random. So you can apply statistical tests to see if they're, if they're anomalous in some way. And these sorts of things, statistical tests can't say for certain that fraud has occurred, but they can certainly point, you know, point out suspicions. Uh, and if something seems sufficiently improbable, then you know, one, one has confidence that something funny is going on. The improbability principle, why coincidences, miracles, and rare events happen every day, I think it is a must-read for anyone interested at all in this field. And, and if you're not, I think you will be after you read the book. I'm curious, Professor Hand, what, what you are working on these days or what you're excited about uh, in the future of your field. Ah, yes. There's so much. It's statistics. Statistics has sort of come of age all of a sudden with, with notions like big data and data science. Data are just sort of flooding in now. So I think this is the best time to be around for a statistician. And I would indeed encourage anybody with the slightest interest in the area to get into it. You know, there are a huge, huge number of job opportunities, very highly remunerated. And you can solve very interesting and indeed very important problems if you want to make a difference to humanity. Statistics is where to be at the moment. Professor David Hand, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a, a real honor to speak with you and uh, really enjoy your work. And I hope we get to chat again soon. Thank you very much indeed. I've enjoyed it. Thanks. It really was a pleasure to speak with Professor Hand and I'm very appreciative of his time. You know, I find it somewhat ironic now. I think math, math is pretty damn cool. But I know Jim of 20 years ago, as he was struggling through calculus, probably would not have had the same view. But uh, the world of mathematics now, extremely, extremely fascinating stuff. I do have one copy of David Hand's book, The Improbability Principle, Why Coincidences, Miracles, and Rare Events Happen Every Day, that I would like to give away to one of our listeners who's enjoyed the interview. I'll give it away to the first person to email me, jim at hauntedwalk.com. So the first person to email me asking for the book, you will get the book. Uh, so good luck to, to early listeners. We'll see who grabs it. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Always a pleasure to have you along. As I said, we'd love to get a five-star review from you on iTunes, or if you have any ideas about the show, a guest you'd like to see, topics, I would love to hear from you as well. Or if you just want to reach out and say hi, my email address is jim at hauntedwalk.com. Until we meet again, sweet dreams. Sweet dreams.